This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Ethiopia Sidama ethnic group vote on autonomy. The World Food Programme warns of a deteriorating humanitarian situation in the Sahel. And TPOK Jazz Band in the DRC is keeping the memory of music maestro Franco Luambo alive. This is Africa Live. Hello and a warm welcome. I am Penina Karibe. Also coming up this hour. Intra-Africa trade gets a $250 million boost from the Africa Development Bank and ABSA. And we update you on the road to the AFCON and South Africa home in on a qualification slot. A polls have opened in Ethiopia's southern nations, nationalities and peoples region where the Sidama people are voting on self-determination in a referendum closely watched by other ethnic groups. Around 2.3 million voters are registered at nearly 1,700 polling stations. The Sidama make up about 4% of Ethiopia's 105 million people. If the referendum passes, the Sidama will control local taxes, education, security and laws. Many voters lined up before dawn at polling stations to cast their ballot. I arrived here at 2 a.m. in order to cast my vote early. This is the day we've been waiting for. It's like when a woman waits for the day she will give birth. I thank God for having this day. And that is why I came early to cast my vote. By Abel Abate, a political analyst in Addis Ababa. Uh, Abel, how significant is this referendum? Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this uh, referendum is significant in so many levels. Uh, but particularly its impact on three things cannot be overstated. The first one is constitutionalism uh, and in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a con constitutionally uh, federated country where you have nine, ethnic, nine ethnically organized regional uh, states and now we are going to have probably if the voters are going to vote actually for uh, Sidama uh, independent regionhood will be having a tense regional state so uh, how that's going to be accommodated in the constitution without the amendment is the first question and the second question in line with this is actually there are nearly two dozen ethnic groups who are who have been demanding actually the same referendum as of Sidamas in the southern regional state and uh, if you know the southern regional state is uh, uh, an amalgam of 56 ethnic groups so how the authorities is is going to accommodate the remaining questions is also something to be seen and the second one is uh, its implication on security uh, can, can should be also mentioned uh, in july uh, uh, a few months back actually uh, th there was a, a d dispute over the election timetable with the authorities and particularly with the electoral board that led to a huge damage on human life and on the lives of civilians and also property and the third one uh, in line with this is actually uh, its implication on the upcoming national election uh, is also something to be seen uh, because this can be seen as a litmus test actually how Ethiopia is going to have uh, a free, fair and accommodative election in few weeks, man, if, in few months' time. So uh, its implication particularly on those three areas uh, cannot be overstated. All right, Abel, you did mention the national elections. This, there are concerns that this referendum could further destabilize Ethiopia ahead of those elections. Do you share the same concerns? I mean, there are, uh, I mean, it's obviously actually there are concerns, uh, widespread concerns as actually this uh, uh, referendum might have actually a huge implication on the upcoming election. But uh, since this is actually the first election that is going to be held by the newly reformed electoral board, if it's also going to be held in peaceful and uh, also free and fair manner, uh, it could also serve as actually uh, as a litmus test actually for the upcoming election and actually it, it might have uh, some positive uh, positive re results for the upcoming election but it's definitely uh, a decisive one uh, and its implication is far-reaching you can say that well it's a delicate balance for the prime minister isn't it promoting political liberalization 
while trying to maintain stability. How will this impact the upcoming elections? I mean, it can affect in so many levels, as I said earlier on. Uh, we all are hoping at this point, actually, this will be uh, free and fair, and that is being acceptable, actually, by all the, poli by the political forces. Uh, now the Sidamas uh, are actually, uh, camp we are campaigning, actually, for uh, an independent region, hood, but there are also concerns from the minority ethnic groups in the southern regional states about their self safety and well-being, uh, whether the election is going to have, actually, a new independent region in the south or actually if the election is going to be contested uh, and what will be actually the security implication. So, uh, and Ethiopia, as you know, is having lots of troubles these days. Uh, mainly uh, identity-based attacks are getting out of hand and the government response is being actually criticized by so many people. So, uh, the handling of this election uh, will have actually a big impact on actually uh, on public trust and the way the national election is handling uh, such affairs and also actually how the security forces are responding to this kind of events and it, it will have a far-reaching impact and people are uh, so far actually uh, casting their uh, votes uh, peacefully uh, from the sources that we we seen actually from uh, from the air and so, so far it was peaceful uh, but the process uh, and most importantly the results will have a far-reaching impact and uh, the government said actually they have done, they have done uh, everything in their disposal actually to make it actually this is free, peaceful and acceptable by all the political parties. The Prime Minister this morning tweeted uh, saying it, uh, all stakeholders should work, should work on, uh, the, should, wo should work the, uh, the referendum to be peaceful. So uh, there is a huge interest uh, across the board actually to have a peaceful incredible election the process so far uh, it, the vote started a couple of hours ago the All process right. so far is being uh, uh, confirmed by actors actually uh, really uh, or, uh, good but uh, we have to see actually the election results particularly the preliminary elections results are coming out in the coming two three days and how uh, people are going to react and uh, what will be the process will definitely matter uh, the upcoming uh, uh, its implication on the upcoming election well. all right table let's leave it there for now thank you very much for those insights able about a life for us there in addis ababa images may appear to be identical but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. As the security situation worsens in the Sahel, so is the humanitarian situation. The World Food Programme is raising alarm over the worsening situation in Burkina Faso and neighboring countries. CGTN's Tuli Shabalala has that story. 61-year-old Zor Youssef has taken refuge in a makeshift shelter in Pesila, a town north of the capital Ouagadougou. Yusuf and his 24 family members fled on foot from the village of Guba in search of safety from militant attacks. When they killed my brother, I hid in a riverbed and I came back in the morning to save my family. I left everything behind, no bicycle, no clothes, just the clothes that I'm wearing right now. They made it here where they live among more than 36,000 displaced people. And life is not easy. People here need assistance. What we need now is food. Everything else can wait. Once we get food, then we will worry about clothes. The United Nations World Food Programme and other humanitarian agencies are trying to address the growing crisis. But they are running out of funds to support the relief efforts. As we speak, millions of people are desperately hungry in the Sahel. Hundreds of thousands of people are being displaced. Thousands of people are being killed because of extremism and violence. In Burkina Faso alone, there's been a 500% uptick and increase in displacement. One third of the nation is now a conflict area. This is a catastrophe, and we've got to act. 
and we've got to act now. The World Food Program says it urgently needs 150 million U.S. dollars for operations across the Sahel. The money will go towards emergency relief and resilience building programs for 2.4 million people from Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. On to the latest from the attack in Mali. The death toll of soldiers has risen to 30 in Monday's assault against an army patrol near the border with Niger. CGTN's Wilkis Sanyabo reports. The soldiers came under attack in the northern Gao region as they were on patrol during a joint operation with troops from Niger. This incident comes just weeks after militants attacked a military base and killed 54 soldiers. Hours before the Malian army reported the new attack, Senegalese President Macky Sall had raised concerns on the security coordination in the Sahel. More than 14,000 men from the MINUSMA are on the field which is taken hostage by a bunch of individuals. There is a problem. Why are we not capable of dealing with this? We need to figure out and put together actions and gather everyone into one command. That is where the UN has to be able to come and bring in new concepts. Otherwise, as I've already said, we are not here to put the UN on trial, but it has to agree to reform itself and reform its procedures. Violence in the Sahel has surged in the recent past with heavy military and civilian losses in Mali and Burkina Faso. But this is not the Secretary General's fault. It is the fault of the states themselves, particularly the permanent members of the Security Council. On the subject of mandates, they can block if one or five does not agree, then they can stop the project for good. There lies the problem. Mali needs a robust mandate. No group has so far claimed responsibility over Monday's assault. From strongholds in Mali, groups with Al-Qaeda and Islamic State links have been able to fan out across the Sahel, also destabilizing parts of Niger and Burkina Faso. Wilkes Anyabwa, CGTN. Let's discuss this further with Roy Okedibie, a security consultant and a retired military officer. He joins us live from Lagos. Roy, thank you very much for joining us. The French Prime Minister has just concluded a visit to Senegal. He promised more support. What do you make of this? Roy, can you hear me? All right, I'm afraid uh, we seem to have some communication problem with Roy. We shall try and reconnect with him in just a bit. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a quick break. Straight ahead. In Hong Kong, a cleanup begins following the latest violence and schools reopen after six days. And a community-based organization in Kenya maps informal settlements to provide access to essential services. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. 
Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Africa Live. Before the break, we were discussing the insecurity in the Sahel region. And we have Roy Okidibi, a security consultant and retired military officer. He's live for us in Lagos. Hopefully, Roy, you can hear me now. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Great. So let's talk about this issue. The French Prime Minister just concluded his visit to Senegal and he promised more support. What do you make of this? Well, um, I think um, we should be done with um, foreign support for physically combating terrorism and uh, militancy in Africa. We should, um, we should resist any form of um, physical intervention, physical support in um, um, security situations in Africa. Where we should be happy to have such support from France and other countries should be in the areas of um, regulating the vendors that manufacture these um, weapons of mass destruction. We should um, need support in the areas of curbing free transfer of finance monitoring um, transfer of funds, financial support, and aid to militant groups, terrorist groups. We should uh, monitor such support should be targeted towards the movement of persons through countries where they go through to build cells and train these people. So these are the areas we need support. And I also like them to give us support in resisting African leaders from um, using their banks in France and Britain and US to keep funds that are supposed to develop Africa. And these are the development crises that we have that is easy for terrorist groups to um, easily recruit persons that are into um, poverty lines that are poorly educated to destroy the, the, the fatherland where they exist. Now, despite mass mobilization of defense and security forces, it's the same story in the Sahel. Extremist groups continue to launch deadly attacks. Is this the time to change the strategy, perhaps? Well, um, in the course of my, my service to countries, even in Africa, where I've gone for peacekeeping when I was in the military, I've discovered that um, the, the possibility to breach um, strongholds, especially military strongholds and um, military formations, government security agency formations by militants, terrorist groups, is because um, sometimes they overstay. They have spent too long a time at designated posting areas, designated trouble spot areas. They begin to compromise the security, they begin to breach intelligence protection, they begin to have undue familiarity. Especially we have had cases of military generals going into business transactions with um, locals. We have had cases of um, military um, generals protecting um, um, <laughs> militants that exist in areas where they have overstayed their tenure of um, engagement. So I would advise that we tighten up our news, we, we put in strategies that we rotate personnel in such areas, which should also in, um, allow penalties to be applied to those that violate um, rules of engagement. All right, so as we wrap up, Roy, very briefly, there have been also recommendations for a holistic approach in dealing with the security situation in the Sahel, but there seems to be no coordinated plan, especially by the Western governments. Each seems to be reading from a different script. Why is that? Well, um, the, the breakdown of coordination is uh, not far-fetched. If, if you look at the unfortunate um, irregular activities on economic relationship, if you look at the unfortunate um, political interest, the, the political um, um, gangsterism that is going on in Africa, 
if you look at all of these breaches, especially the economic and the political, you will see why there is breakdown of trust between African nations, especially nations that exist in the Sahel, to, to, to fully coordinate their security agencies to curb opportunities of um, militancy and terrorism. You will also remember that um, there is um, drug peddling going on in all of these areas. There is um, mining for precious minerals going on in all of these areas. And these have actually compromised trust. And then um, political activities also is there, where you'll see countries are getting support from sister nations, brother nations around themselves to engage and institute a, a candidate in a country where it does not have popular support. So all of these have not created the opportunity for good cohesion. And that has broken down a lot of correlation that should have curbed insecurity. All right, Roy, we appreciate those insights. Thank you very much for joining us. Roy Okidibie, a security consultant and former a retired military officer like for us there in Lagos. Now, efforts to clean up have begun in Hong Kong. Primary and secondary schools have reopened after being closed for six days. There are scattered incidents of protesters stopping trains and blocking traffic, but it's on a much smaller scale than the demonstrations of the past week. City workers are inspired damage to a main road tunnel that remains closed after protesters torched the toll booths and a small group of protesters remains at Hong Kong Polytechnic University for fear of being arrested once they leave. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has summoned a senior American diplomat in Beijing to protest the U.S. Senate's passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. The bill ties Washington's assessment of human rights conditions in the city to potential sanctions. Vice Foreign Minister Ma Zhaoxu told the U.S. Charged Affair that Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China and the city's governance are entirely China's internal affairs. The Chinese official said no external forces are allowed to interfere. Manola Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson has had some stern words. Here's what he had to say. Hong Kong is part of China, and Hong Kong affairs are purely China's internal affairs. We are telling the U.S. to recognize the situation, immediately take measures to stop the bill from becoming law, and stop interfering in China's internal affairs. If the U.S. side insists on going its own way, China will definitely take strong measures to counter it. In Berlin, Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has met German Chancellor Angela Merkel for bilateral talks during an Africa Investment Summit. The G20 compact with Africa began Tuesday. Chancellor Merkel called for more investment in the African continent, which she says offers more chances than risks. But Germany says it wants better credit guarantees. Leaders are expected to talk about investment opportunities, transparency and trust issues. Addressing the root causes of mass migration from underdeveloped to developed countries is a major issue. For that, Africa has come up high on the G20 agenda. Merkel says that boosting private investment from Germany will help the continent achieve a self-supporting upturn. In South Africa, nurses in the country's public health sector have shown that quality health care doesn't necessarily come with the high cost of private medical care. Nurses at one of Cape Town's oldest public hospitals have recently garnered a number of awards for their innovative approach while tending to the needs of the sick and vulnerable. Sajitian's Travis Andrews has more. It's clocking time and the day shift is about to begin. But before that, a bit of exercise to keep the mind in focus. These are the nursing staff at Huerdeskia Hospital, a public facility where the world's first heart transplant took place. And these lot are carrying over with that proud tradition. The hospital is one of the busiest in the Western Cape due to the high number of patients injured through violent crimes. And nurses here are kept on their feet all the time. A teaching academic hospital we work closely with the universities. Our staff is very experienced. They continuously on the education drive. And if you look at the standard of work we do here compared to other hospitals, I mean, everybody's striving. Uh, I mean, I can't compare now and, and mention hospitals. But I think Hortiski is always ahead of everybody else because we continuously on this, this journey of innovation, do things differently. The hospital employs over 1,700 nurses and recently scooped most of the awards for provincial nursing excellence. 
Wound care specialist Moira Kinnis was one of them. But the award is not just an endorsement, but an opportunity to raise many preconceived ideas the public have on the public health system. It's very important for me to give the service to the in the public hospital to the to the patients because a lot of our patients that can't afford the the private sector. So most of them is pensioners and disability people. So it's really important for me that my service to them. Kruniske is one of two local teaching hospitals where the next crop of medical specialists are nurtured. And the hospital was also awarded for its excellence in the transfer of important knowledge and skills. I think the patients that come to Kruniske are, are obviously in need of care and they have um, many um, conditions and they're obviously scared when they come. So that it's important for the nurses to know how to interact with the patients. And, and I think it really, for myself, in terms of like the nurses that come after their training for community service, that they grow in their role and they can guide the future generations to come. The Department of Health believes that through the dedication of nurses breaking traditional stereotypes of government funded health, a new trend is emerging. They could see more and more private sector patients opt for cheaper state-run clinical care. There may be significant financial strain on public hospitals, but that hasn't stopped the more than 70,000 nurses working here in the Western Cape from trying to deliver their best service. And it is that commitment to doing their jobs well that is slowly driving people's faith back into the public health system. That's Andrew, CGTN. Cape Town. The informal settlement of Kibera is about 2.5 square kilometers in size with a population of about 200,000 people. For years, getting access to essential services for Kibera's residents has been a huge challenge until now. But one community-based organization, Map Kibera, has mapped the entire settlement, providing much-needed data for the government and development partners to ensure essential services are available for the residents. And as CGT and Zurubat Nagila reports, other informal settlements are adopting the model. A five-minute walk from his workplace finds Zach Wambua at the Three Belt Primary School in the heart of Kibera, one of the largest informal settlements in Africa. Zach is part of MOP Kibera, an organization using technology to empower communities by mapping the settlements and where essential services are available. We also engage different stakeholders that are working in those communities like organization, uh, CBOs, getting to understand like what kind of information they would like to see on a map. Today, he is gathering data on one of the schools affected by recent demolitions using a mobile phone app with survey questions. Once the survey is complete, he sets the exact GPS coordinates, takes pictures of the school and heads back to the office to download the data. So in 2009... Project manager like, Jack Ogura says the project came about by chance. We were lucky to meet a team from OpenStreetMap who had visited Kibera. And so out of engaging with them, we realized that they could help us start map our community. Now, a decade later, Map Kibera has transformed the settlement. Working with the local community, the team collects data on essential services and maps them. We ended up in, uh, with four thematic areas, which was security, uh, water and sanitation, education and health. The data is then used by government agencies and aid organizations to direct services where required. One beneficiary was the immediate former member of parliament, Ken Court, who passed away recently from cancer. We used our map to build new schools in Kibra and even to improve some and re renovate some. On security, the organization mapped out dangerous areas and the government installed floodlights and built additional police posts. So successful was the project that organizations like the UN Habitat and the World Bank partnered with Project Kibera to ensure access to essential services. What started off as a project seeking to benefit the residents of Kibera has turned out to be so much more. 
A decade later, having seen the advantages, other communities across the country are replicating the same model through Map Kibera. Robert Nagela, CJTN, Kibera, Nairobi. You're watching Africa Live, coming up in business news. Intra-Africa Trade gets a $250 million boost from the Africa Development Bank as well as ABSA. And South African Airways resumes some regional flights while suffering from a crippling strike. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business weekdays at this time on CGTN. The African Development Bank, otherwise known as AFDB, has agreed to a, one, to a $250 million trade financing deal with financial services group ABSA. This is in line with AFDB's plan to foster inter and intra-Africa trade and reduce the trade financing gap on the continent. According to reports, the two institutions will share the default risk on a portfolio of eligible trade transactions originated by African issuing banks. This is subject to confirmation by ABSA for the duration of the facility. Facility. Meanwhile, ABSA, leveraging AFDB's AAA rating, will underwrite trade transactions issued by African issuing banks. Targeted sectors include agriculture, energy, and light manufacturing. The focus will be on small and medium-sized enterprises in low-income African countries. Today, November 20th, is Africa Industrialization Day. The African Union is marking the day at an event in Addis Ababa alongside the World Export Development Forum, which runs throughout the week. Ethiopia's President Saleh Wakzede started things off. She challenged African governments to implement policies that will fast track the continent's path towards becoming an exporting hub. Saleh Work said Ethiopia has a vision of becoming a regional manufacturing hub by 2025. The Africa Continental Free Trade area was recently launched, implementation should begin on July 1st next year. Participants at the Africa Industrialization Day note that the agreement offers a huge opportunity for the continent to trade within itself using processed goods. With some regional flights back in operation, South African Airways says only a deal with striking unions can keep it in the air. All flights to the airline's eight international destinations and six others across Africa are operating as usual. The African destinations include Accra, Lagos, Lusaka, Maputo, Winok and Harare. On Tuesday, the airline met with unions and the Public Enterprise Ministry to resolve a strike that has entered its sixth day. Last week, cabin crews and technicians downed tools to demand higher pay and has stopped the airline's retrenchment plans. This forced the debt-ridden national carrier to cancel hundreds of flights, which has affected thousands of passengers. I will never fly SAA again, ever, and I don't even know if I'll come back to, the, uh, to, to South Africa again. It's just been so inconvenient. It's costing me a lot of money now. The company was very helpful up to now. Uh, I didn't have a ticket, but they're putting me on another flight. Uh, this morning, uh, next tomorrow morning, half past three, I will be flying to Lome and from there to Abidjan. But they were very helpful. In the meantime, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa says negotiations to end the ongoing workers' strike have collapsed. According to the trade union, the government and South African Airways refused to agree the work to the workers' revised salary demand of 6.5%. South Africa claims it's in no position to increase the wage offer. While we were in the midst of negotiations, after they placed an offer on the table of 6.5%, which we believe could have been accepted by our members and would have been enough to settle the strike, they then withdrew the offer literally at the 11th hour. It is completely incorrect that you can make an offer and then just suddenly withdraw it, which is exactly what South African Airways management did. They claimed when they withdrew the offer that they didn't have a mandate, they suddenly don't have money, and they're putting back on the table what was the original offer, which was the very reason that our members are still on strike. 
Well, another hurdle is facing Africa's most industrialized economy. After a four-month search, cash-strapped South African power utility Eskom has announced Numpak's underwriter as its new CEO. But investors don't seem to be showing much faith in the new boost. CGTN's Angela Kopler explains. The writer is currently the CEO of Nampak, the continent's largest packaging company. He was also in senior positions at Cecil, the listed coal-to-fuel business. He replaces former group chief executive Pakamani Khadebe, who left the entity at the end of July. The rate starts on 15 January. I hope that the government gives him a free reign, because I think it's not just the individual. I think the very good individuals in places like ESCOM or Transnet, all our state-owned enterprises, the problem is the politicians don't give them the rope that they need and the freedom they need to do what they have to do. The bigger picture is that, as Cyril Ramaphosa, the president, said, ESCOM is simply too big to fail. But government has, for one reason or another, tended to interfere in its operations, which have impacted its business. And then there's the country risk that also has to be factored into the equation. I think that it's prudent for the stakeholder being government to be around the table, but I think government also has to take an appreciation that the executive has to make executive decisions, he has to make those decisions as part of a team, and those decisions have to be merit-based, based on the situation that the institution is in, rather than purely political decisions. The rater has all the qualifications and experience needed to get the job done, but there is one quality that some analysts are looking for. Is he sufficiently ruthless? Because that's what's needed. Time will tell. I think that that's a possibility that he is that sort of person. And I hope that's what's being recognized, that he's the guy they're going to let, let go and say, hey, he wants to, 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 to lay off so many workers. Do it. The appointment of a hard-nosed businessman to run this failing SOE is good news because government has probably realized that they can't put a political appointee in place. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Let's shift our focus to the stock market. Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba is set to offer the investors of its Hong Kong shares a slight discount to its U.S.-listed depository shares. The move comes as Asia's most valuable company prepares to kick off the world's largest initial public offering this year. With the details, here's our reporter, CGTN's Shu Xinchen. Right here will soon become the second home for shares of China's e-commerce giant Alibaba. An interesting move amid all of the chaotic scenes troubling Hong Kong right now. Recent protests may have changed Hong Kong's future economic outlook, but its stock market is still resilient. Alibaba's decision to list on the HKEX sent stocks there soaring in Wednesday trading. While Hong Kong's Hansen Index endured a bearish market in August, hitting a low of 25,300 on August the 13th, but has rebounded to 27,000. So we are tapping Chinese investors, we are tapping um, you know, Asian-based investors. So Hong Kong is just a platform, you know, no matter you know, what the situation will be. I think uh, the stock exchange uh, will not be affected you know, by the recent uh, situation. Market size, however, is not the only thing the e-commerce giant has to think about. Alibaba is Chinese, yet listed in New York. With uncertainty still surrounding China-U.S. relations, the firm is encouraged to find ways to hedge. In particular, you know, the, uh, the relationship between China and the state uh, has not been really stable in the past few uh, months or years. So, uh, strategically speaking, you know, for Alibaba, I think it need to diversify, you know, it um, will help, you know, the company the, to obtain a, a broader fundraising uh, uh, platform. Alibaba says shares on the New York Stock Exchange and Hong Kong Stock Exchange are interchangeable. And with possible inclusion into the Stock Connect schemes between mainland markets and Hong Kong in the future, Alibaba's shares can welcome a broader base of investors. Xu Xingchen, CGTN, Hong Kong. As countries around the world ramp up preparations for 5G, there is big money to be made. In Brazil, an auction is expected to take place next year for companies to place bids on the network frequencies. Chinese telecom giant Huawei is a leading contender, but as CGTN's Paulo Cabral reports, there are some delicate politics involved. Over the last few months, Huawei has been investing in Brazil's consumer market. The Chinese company has gained ground and brand recognition with its smartphones, but another major game is about to kick off. 
The establishment of Brazil's 5G network, expected to be put to auction next year. One big question is whether Huawei gets a true shot at winning the contract. Huawei has made clear its interest in Brazil's 5G business. The problem is that Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, is a close ally of the US president, Donald Trump, who's been openly campaigning against Huawei in the world's 5G arena, citing concerns over national security. During this month's BRICS summit in Brazil, Bolsonaro met with the Chinese president, Xi Jinping. Just a few weeks earlier, the two met in Beijing. These two meetings and the president's positive statements gave most analysts the impression of warming relations. Monday, President Bolsonaro met the CEO of Huawei in Brazil, Wei Yao, and later confirmed to the media they spoke about 5G. However, Bolsonaro was non-committal on details of the conversation, but made clear there are more players out there in addition to China. I also heard there is a South Korean company in position to operate 5G in Brazil. We'll look into the best offer and the best connectivity. Huawei only showed me today what the company is doing in Brazil nowadays. This professor of international relations says the looming decision on a 5G provider will force Bolsonaro to weigh his pro-Western leanings against a more pragmatic position demanded by business. Whenever we're talking about non-economic matters, certainly Bolsonaro will prefer its alignment not just with Trump, but with other nationalist leaders like Viktor Orban from Hungary or even the Saudis. However, when it comes to economic issues, as the recent BRICS meeting in Brasilia has shown, perhaps Bolsonaro is more willing to concede to uh, immediate demands from Brazilian producers, from Brazilian investors, particularly the need for foreign investment may push Bolsonaro to adopt a more pragmatic approach. Brazil's 5G auction is expected to be among the largest spectrum sales ever, and telecom companies from all over the world are eager to compete for the contract. The question now is how much politics might influence Brazil's choice for which one ultimately comes away with the lucrative winning bid. Paulo Cabral, CGTN, São Paulo. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead. How the TPOK jazz band in the DRC is keeping the memory of music maestro Franco Luambo alive. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. to bring you stories of struggle, survival, and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back. A popular music group founded by legendary Congolese musician Franco Luambo Machiari in 1956 is keeping the musician's memory alive across the Democratic Republic of Congo. TPOK Jazz Band is composed of young musicians who have given the group a new life after it broke up after Franco's death in 1989. CGTN's Chris, Chris Chamringa caught up with them in Kinshasa. <laughs> The DRC capital is renowned for producing famous musicians. Many young Congolese music stars have emerged in recent years, but the sounds of older musicians like legendary guitarist and songwriter Franco Luambo Macchiadi are still loved here, even by young people. I prefer listening to songs of Franco Luambo than those of musicians of my generation. The OK Jazz Band was founded by Franco and other musicians in 1956. It was later renamed TPOK, which stands for Tout Puissant, 
or the Almighty Band, but Franco's death in 1989 led to the disintegration of the group. It was however revived by these youthful members in 2011. When we restored this band, a number of other musicians became very envious of us. They thought TPOK Jazz would never return. All they wanted was to take the place of Franco. But it's not that easy to take over his place. The band's songs were very famous across East and Central Africa in the 1980s. Music of the solace to hundreds of companies going through the daily rigors of life. And members of the TPOK Jazz Band know how to keep their audience swaying to their songs with their oldies. The band recorded such great success in the 80s that a street in Kinshasa was named in honor of its leader, Franco Luambo Macchiadi. We realized that Franco had left us with many great songs, and we had to push for him to be honored. It would be a big mistake for the band to break up after his death. Hundreds of unemployed Congolese in Kinshasa have taken up music careers, hoping to make it big one day. But not many of them have received the kind of international acclaim that Franco and the TPOK Jazz Band got in their heyday. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. And coming up in sports. We update you on the road to the AFCON, a South Africa home in on a qualification slot. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, find your game. Africa Live, find your voice. We start in Egypt where the Olympic pharaohs have crushed South Africa 3-0 in the second semi-finals match. Egypt are now guaranteed a spot in Tokyo and will now shift their focus to the continental 